Thank you. All right, uh, Danny, welcome back. I want to thank you for reaching out to tell me about this uh, new report you have. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hopefully you can. Yeah. Uh, would, were you going to show anything in the report? Yeah, I have a chart you... I'd like to show. Okay, so uh, you just okay. punched the green button, share screen? Yeah, yep. I want to show a chart. I think it's a scary chart. It's coming. Here we are. All right. Okay. So here's the... Can I talk about the chart? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes, go so ahead. Start off. Obviously, the story that I have been worried about, and it's really about central banks, and it's about what central banks are up to and okay. um, what they've done in the last dozen years. M my view approximately is that every action of tightening in the last 12 years has been an error. So the, the Fed and the Bank of England missed the Great Recession. They wrongly tightened from 2015 to 18, and most of it was because they didn't really understand kind of what was coming. So the story is that, you know, we, we, we date recessions from the NBR dating group six to a dozen months after the recession has been caused. But the work that I've been doing with my pal Alex Price, and we've written three papers in the last month or so because we got on a roll. And the answer is that consumer confidence is a really big deal. And it adds pretty well to your conversation a minute ago. And the answer is that consumer confidence, consumer expectations, fear of unemployment turns out to predict perfectly well six of the last six recessions, Dale. So if you look at these papers, I show you that if you take each okay. of the recessions that the NBR calls, these data give you a call for it between six and, a, and 12 months ahead of time. So if you look at back to 2006, and, and de December 2007 is what the Fed, yeah. what the NBR called the data recession. These data told you by around May of 07 that it was coming. So this is a That's scary true. chart. So this chart, can you see it? The one with the yeah. yellow and the purple. <clears throat> right. So this is uh, the conference board consumer expectations data for the eight biggest states. And the yellows are the peaks in the prior 12 months, which is the rule we use. Look back at the peak in the prior 12 months. What happens to that index over that 12 month period? So December 07 is the start of the recession. So let's just go to uh, Florida. Florida peaks in February 07, falls by 60 points by December 07. California falls by um, 35. New York falls by 25. Ohio falls by 33, uh, 23 and Pennsylvania by 40. So the question then is, well, what the heck's coming? And in the context of the Bank of England talking about tightening, Canada right. talking about tightening, the Fed right. talking about tapering, this looks like an unbelievable error. So here's the data for, for now. So it turns out it looks almost identical to what happened in 07. So look at California. It was peaked at 127.5 in March. It's now at 93. Uh, yeah. 121.3 in Florida. It's now at 94. It's 92.8 so now, Danny. The, 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 the eight of the, these are the eight biggest states. These yeah. suggest to you that the U.S. is going to enter recession at the start of next year. That okay. should put the discussion about tightening in big context. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, was going to ask you, uh, you answered a lot of the questions yeah. that I was going to ask you. Yes, I'm here, Danny. Can you hear me? Yeah, if you want to keep going, I will. I just, I just want to make sure that you can see that and we can talk yeah. about this. Yeah. And, so and, uh, and so the, the final thing is that, Basically, there's, and, and we can talk about what other evidence of tightening there is. We just got a Gallup Consumer Sentiment Index out yesterday. That was minus 33 in April 20. It reached a peak of one in June 21. And yesterday, it went to minus 25. So these consumer sentiment indices, A, have collapsed, but B, they're predictive. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, I'm I, sorry. I was... Dale, do you mind? Uh, hi, Danny. I'm, I'm Blake Morrow. And, hi, and Blake. To, hi, how are you? I'm good. Hey, thanks for joining us today. And Dale, I'm so sorry to interject. I, I don't think you saw my Skype message. I, I actually wanted to see if um, I could ask Danny a question about the, the Fed. Based on the, the data that you're seeing, do you think that the Fed might be making a policy error? Um, you know, Definitely. With, That's what he was oh, getting at. That, that, oh, that, that's, sorry. Exact, that's exactly the point. And I can yeah. talk more about this, and we should. But supposing this was true, right? 
I mean, you can't rule out the possibility that this is this is this time it's because everything is so weird that this time it's wrong. But nothing else, zero else predicts the prior six. So the data is what the data is. And I've got lots more of it. But this is a simple way of showing it. So if these data are right, then the Fed tightening will be a huge error. The Bank of England, in fact, you can show the Bank of England would also would be a huge error too. And I call yeah, they're uh, talking these, for interest rate hikes. We're only yes. talking about well, tapering, I'm also talking so about, they're more about aggressive. Tightening, about tapering, because tapering amounts to tightening monetary policy in the face of in the face of a slowing economy. Well, you know, let me push back, Danny. Do you think the Fed has to keep buying? Uh, MBSs with a housing shortage and record prices and well, maybe, people maybe being shut out be of it. Yeah, right. Does maybe, the housing maybe. market really need that support, Danny? Well, maybe it just switches to buy to buy and treasure. Well, I mean, then I why think, haven't yeah, they? Why well, they're Dale, creating? My point would be, why well, my aren't point, they? My point more would be wait and watch. Wait in a few months to see what happens isn't going to make that much difference. But I agree with yeah. you. The idea Sheila that, Bear said the same thing. She, she oh, she's agree. afraid. Are you well, I'm for it too. So, so let me just go with a few other things. Okay. So, so what have we seen since these data started to turn? Well, we obviously got slowing GDP yesterday. Um, I think that's potentially likely, but we have a whole series of surveys asking people um, about COVID. And I think COVID and Delta is particularly what's driven this. There's evidence that people are scared to go back to work. A survey in Britain this week, 40% of people said, I'm going to quit my job if I have to go back to work and work with someone who's unvaccinated. So well, the that's a great resignation, be, Danny, right? Yeah, even resignation. Right. Yeah. And the, sto the story, there's a Grant Thornton survey and a conference board survey where they ask people, you know, are you fearful of going back to work where, there's not, you know, where you're forced to go back to work? And I think some of it's that that looks to be consistent with what's going on in the data. And so then a lot of it's amongst women. And what we've just seen is women saying, I'm fearful of going back to the office. Um, and this is exactly what happened to my daughter. My daughter had a job where she was told on Monday she has to go back to the office. She's got three young kids. She's got to go back to the office. She'd been working remotely. She quit in the hour, within the hour. Got another job where she didn't have to go back remotely. So I think the issue here is very crazy data, crazy data in the labor market. I mean, I'm a labor economist. When the unemployment rate rises, wage growth doesn't normally rise, which is what we've seen. So, so I think these data are really, um, they're flashing red. They were flashing amber. Now they're flashing red. And, and I take your point that you want to be careful about what you do. But my view would be, you better at the best, my action would be, you better sit and wait and watch. And yeah, you were for the done. bazookas uh, uh, firing off and felt comfortable that, you know, Yellen and Bernanke had it under control, that they went big and they were going to continue to go big. But uh, some of these inflation numbers, I know you mm -hmm. said with inflation, well, like when lumber was going up, Danny, you said, well, you know, they could find a replacement material. Yeah. I, I, but, you I know, mean, uh, how do you find replacement uh, food items? Well, the answer is if the price of meat goes up, you buy fish. That's what happens. I mean, the, okay. the classic story. I mean, I'm, I'm, so I think the listeners have to get what a central banker does. So I, I'm, I made 36 decisions in a row. And each month you think, well, we, we, look at the decision I made last month and the things that I thought about. Was I wrong yeah. then? And what's changed since? But the big deal I always had in my head, which is what does what impacts are there on inflation 18 months ahead? Now, just because something goes up by 5% today, right? Something goes up by 5%. Well, it may well remain at that price in a year's time. But if it just remains there, inflation is zero. And the question is, well, okay, if a price rises now, what's the argument for it to continue? Because if it rises 3% in a year's time, if it just remains flat, inflation is zero. So the question is, what causes it to rise again next year? But I think listeners don't kind of get this quite. Um, the, the inflation measure is a measure of the price of a representative basket of goods. But if the price of a particular good rises, then you don't buy it and you buy something else that's cheaper, which means that in principle, the basket of goods that you're referring to changes. Most of the things in this basket of goods, you can avoid buying. You either don't buy them at all or you buy a substitute. And even when the price of gas goes up, you can respond to it by driving less, by 
you know, buy 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 smaller cars and so on. Yeah. So heat I your think, home le- heat your home less and no, uh, no, you're yeah, right on right? the on the context of you know, obviously it's harder the more. How about wages, more. Danny? I mean, uh, wages. Uh, okay, we're giving you a raise, but we want to take inflation down a notch. I'm yeah, giving but, you uh, a but remember, pay cut. But remember, Dale. Cut. But I, I have a little story which people a you nice know, way of saying it. <laughs> think about. For, let's just make a little story. Um, each month inflation comes in at point one, so we're merrily muddling along. Inflation is one point two each month. We drop a point one and we gain a point one, and then the next someone month, said ride your bike. Dan. Okay, let's just get this. We get point ones, <laughs> and then in month January we get four percent in that single month. So now in each month, then after that we get point one. So what happens is for the next year inflation is five point one each each month. It's five point one. But then in a year's time, that four drops out and the central bank and me knows it's going to drop out. And you say, oh, look, inflation's five. It's terrible. It's five. And I say nothing to see here because there's a four. And the four is what's lifted this thing up. And the big question we should debate is, OK, things have lifted now. Tell me why in a year's time they're going to lift again. Just because they've ro- risen it this year, you know, that's fine. But that's inflation zero next year. Prices next year could be higher but inflation could still be zero. So the answer is, what is there in there, which is Christine Lagarde's point, right. Jay Powell's, why would inflation rise again? And I see nothing to suggest it will. Well, because uh, if we don't have me, your recession, Dale. If, we don't, if we don't, no, let me ask this question. If we don't have this a recession, uh, prices like metals, where it takes eight years to bring on a new mine, to generate production and copper is going to be a big part of the environmentally friendly green economy that the supplies are uh, this squeeze on supplies may not be alleviated next year or the year well, after. That, that, that only right. a recession would cure that price well, problem Dale, the issue i mean the issue is not so much the price of commodities let's say go from 100 to 200 and you yeah. say to me wow the price is really high but if next year the price is 200 and it's still 200 that's fine prices are really high but inflation zero inflation is zero that's the first thing and the second thing is you said much the same about timber prices right so yeah. timber prices rose like crazy so what happens well people stop using timber I mean, that, that, that's what happens. So we've seen yeah. moves up in commodity prices, but you know, pe- people started building patios outside their restaurants because of, of COVID. People were building. I've got, I've got that. Yeah, my, we, are, my, we my, adjust. It's amazing we adjust. how we adjust. We adjust yes. that. And I think that the issue has to be, I just don't think people understand that for, for you to argue that inflation rises, it's not about our prices higher. It's about, yeah, there's a price increase from 100 to 200. That means the price of commodities is much higher than it's been forever. But if it stays at 200 for the next year and the year after that, inflation is zero. That's it. So I, I, okay. I don't buy the argument. You know, p- p- I mean, people stop buying wood. When, you, when the price, I mean, I, I had to buy some new windows. And the price of aluminum windows rose dramatically with the tariffs. Well, then people started selling vinyl windows. You look for substitutes that are cheaper so that that's what people will do but i just you know well it makes me want to go out and buy a million shares of beyond meat dale go ahead steve (laughs) go go ahead (laughs) hello mr buy some beyond meat uh, artificial food danny Uh, well but you but you take the point so i uh, let's let's have a discussion where we start to say what for a central banker like me who sees these scary things this is really scary this this forecast six of the last six recessions, I see inflation being temporary. And I say to myself, tell me anything that suggests to me in in 12 months time, this is all going to sort of go again. And the analogy, Dale, is I think of this as a a hurricane hits an island, right? So the hurricane hits, well, the water and electricity gets wiped out, the price of food rises, the price of carpenters and roofers and all that goes from 50 bucks to 2000 an hour. Okay, and in six months, we've adjusted to the shock. What's the effect of that huge shock in 12 months' time? Answer, nothing. Zero. The temporary rise in everything, the price of food rises, the price of leaf blowers rises, and in six months, it's over, and the wage of the roofers goes back to normal in 12 months' time. So the question is, why 
why does everybody, I mean, why does everybody think that this thing is going to be permanent where everything we see suggests that it isn't? So tell me something that suggests to me that this rise that you've talked about is going to be repeated next year. And I see nothing um, to tell me that. Go ahead, Steve. Um, go I... to the blunt flower. Um, sorry to interject. It's uh, still no, no, here. Um, okay. Can I reverse some of the arguments and get your academic... Uh, uh, well, not just an academic. I was a central banker, remember? So I, I know, know, I know, that. I know. But but, yeah. but also your ac academic point of view. So, yeah, yes, you, you do combine um, both worlds. Okay. So uh, let me ask you something else. If, if we extend these arguments, is there ever a signal that would make central banks go off zero anymore? Well, it's a great it's a great question. So remember that every one of these arguments over the last decade has been wrong. So so you're right. The question is: Is there something permanently that's going to change that will permanently give us a higher rate of inflation? Um, so the answer over the last twelve years, and I have been in many many discussions on radio and TV about is that exactly this of the inflationistas telling me inflation was coming, and I kept saying it isn't. I think it's hard to see. It's hard to see many of those things happening unless the economy is anywhere close to full employment. And I think, and the book, my not working book, talks a lot about that and basically says that the mistake that people have made is to think the economy actually is running hot when it isn't. The labor market is running hot when it isn't. And I think in all probability, full employment is probably somewhere where the unemployment rate is under two. So unless we unless the labor market really cranks and the workers bargaining power is to rise a lot, the scale of the slack, the scale of the slack in the economy means that none of those arguments is going to take Yes, I, I agree with you. The labor market is never, probably never, never say never, but in the foreseeable future, it's never going to be hot simply because. I, I think that's right. Simply because economic policies, for example, like the minimum wage, will keep preventing the labor market from running hot. Plus, well, plus... it's hard to argue. It's hard to argue that, given that this week we just had a friend of mine who won the Nobel Prize for saying something the opposite of that about the minimum wage. So pretty, pretty hard discussion to make in this week when he showed that minimum wages rises don't really affect employment. And as you raise the minimum wage, productivity rises. But, you know... Besides that, I mean, literally this week, that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. So I think I'm allowed to counter that. Yeah, I think that has, carries some weight. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, al although, now, you know, now I'm what, an economist. Now I'm an economist. What? That was a pretty good riposte, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it, you're, it, you're it was, good, it was. Man. But I'm an economist myself, and I fail to see uh, the price of any product going higher and the demand for that product not decreasing. I, I haven't seen a product that works like that. Well, the answer is the minimum. So go and read the minimum wage books. Just go back to what they did. What they did is pretty interesting. So my friends, Alan Kruger, who sadly passed it eight, two years ago, they were sitting at Princeton University and saw that the state of New Jersey was going to raise the minimum wage. So they decided they'd look and see what it did. So they went to look at fast food houses on the borders of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, right? So New Jersey fast food houses are going to get a rise in the minimum wage. Pennsylvania isn't, and they track what happened. And what they found was that employment didn't change. And they found that one of the big things that happened was that productivity rose because as you paid more, people stayed longer, and that raised productivity. So you could say you you could say you can't believe it, but they won a Nobel Prize for it. The so, fast you know. food argument is a very interesting one because I can counter to that that uh, the previous time I was in New York, not the last time I went, the one before that, and I went to a fast food restaurant. It was full of employees, and the last time I was in New York, which was two years ago. Um, everything but the delivery of food was done by machines in Wendy's. So you had to order uh, well, in a machine. There are weirdnesses going on in the labor market right now, but, but but you can argue on the basis of an anecdote, but, you know, they did win a Nobel Prize for it. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I can, I can anyway, name look, a lot of people, but... Okay, that. That, I mean, I mean yeah. that, so, so the, it's the a big discussion. The, Anyhow, going, going back... So if you go well, back to, if, let's think about what full employment is. And the Fed basically believed that in 2015 to 18, 
that the, the, the labor market was t- was close to full employment because unemployment rates were about three and a half percent. And they expected that wage growth would be, you know, flying. Well, and wage growth never flew. And the reason was that the that, that three and a half was, was far above what the full employment unemployment rate was. And I just want to throw something in there. If you go back and look at Beveridge, so Beveridge wrote this great report. Churchill said to Beveridge, when the war's over, all these troops are coming back from the war and women have worked in factories, they're going to come back to work. What does full employment look like? So he wrote a thing which said, I think 3% unemployment is the full employment rate of, un- of, of you know, the f- is full employment. And he writes 10 years later and he says, well, Keynes wrote to me and said, I think 3% is too low, but let's see what you can do. So in the UK, then he writes 10 years later, in the UK between 1950 and 1960, the unemployment rate averaged one and a half percent. Why shouldn't you get to that again? And unless you do, and unless bargaining power of workers rises, then you're then we're not going to see any of this inflation take off. So central bankers, the answer by default is is inflation by default is going to be one and a half. And your problem probably 18 months ahead is inflation is going to be too low again. So how far down the line, Danny, does um, Powell reverse course on the table? Well, I how think long it's think a really good question, Dale. I think, so my view, my policy prescription would be, boy, this looks bad, but let's hang on and wait a bit. Let's not take yeah. it for a bit. Let's not do anything. Bank of England shouldn't do anything. Well, maybe we'll he'll do happens. that Tuesday. Do you think there's a chance he'll do mm, that? I think, I think what, so let's talk about the Bank of England. So um, the new guy, Pill, came and gave this speech, which is pretty interesting, and Bailey did too, saying basically rate rises are coming. Well, it's pretty interesting. It's quite clear that they haven't, um, I can guarantee you there's no chance they really talked to uh, at least a majority of the people on the um, uh, on the committee. So what we've seen since then is the data have weakened, consumer confidence has weakened, obviously the stuff in the US, and we've started to hear from other members of the committee. So Tom Tenreiro gave a speech this week saying, I ain't raised it. Um, and I think re- re- what's interesting, Dale, is that there has never been an example, apart from a, a couple of times at the end of a tightening cycle, where the bank has gone from a 9-0 vote against to a vote in favor of a change. So that should tell you historically, the market looks to be out. I mean, it was like 100% likely they're going to make a rate rise. And now it's at about, when I looked yesterday, about 60 60% likely. I, I think it would be a huge error. And I think the likelihood of it, well, they may they may do so. It would be a huge mistake. I mean, they're still doing QE there. They're still doing, yeah. QE hasn't even right. finished yet. Right. So the idea that you're going to, with Brexit, I mean, they, they had a forecast come out yesterday, which said that the, the, the government forecasting body said their estimate is that Brexit will lower GDP by 4% in the long run. Well, okay, so you've got Brexit, you've got raging COVID, rising story in the New York Times this morning, that un- unlike everywhere else, COVID... Yeah, yeah I, I believe there's a new variant in the UK. Yeah, apparently there's a new variant there, 6% of cases have got that. So you're yeah. going to say we're going to tighten monetary policy. In the same week, Dale, where, they, where the fiscal authorities cut, um, they cut unemployment benefits, they raised yeah. the social security taxes on jobs... And they cut spending on various things. And you're telling me that the central bank is going to raise rates? I mean, come yeah. on. Come yeah. on, guys. This is You're not the, the only economist that's worried about them uh, pushing, uh, what, you know, pushing in the direction that the economy is going in, which is, you know, uh, basically right. weakening well, I mean, we, after we all, all the free money is gone yeah. now. Well, we listened to Christine Lagarde yesterday. And I do think, I do think Dale, that people have, have underestimated that, that people are responding to COVID. So let's go with one of the, here's the possibility we should think about. So, okay, make, people made all these savings and the expectation is that they're gonna, people are gonna go out and spend them. Well, maybe what's happened is that they've given people a buffer. So it's, so let's, I mean, this data looks to be a bit like this. Women are fearful of going back to work. They're fearful of going to places that don't have masks. They, so what's happened is that we've seen a, an increase in people uh, retiring, particularly amongst yeah. women. But the big story we saw last month, and again, this may be a tick, but it may be a trend. Last month, uh, 25 to 49, 20, 25 to 54 year old women's female, so the female participation rate of these prime age women dropped by 0.7 on the month. 
you know, went from seventy-four point, yeah, went from like seventy-four point seven to seventy-four. This data are noisy, so maybe if it picks back up next month, fine. But imagine we get another month of a drop of point seven. And I think this may well be temporary. You know, the buffer is you've got a, you've got enough buffer, you've got enough savings, so you can sit and watch what COVID does. And, and take six months to protect your family. And then you'll come back when things are more like normal. So I think that's, I think people, people should be fearful of COVID. And in the UK, with raging COVID, much more than any place else and a new variant, um, and basically dr driving it, particularly amongst children at school, people are fearful. And I think hard to, hard to argue that my data that we looked at earlier um, is, not, is not predictive. Maybe it's not. But you sh I don't think people should ignore these data. You should say, no, that's Danny, I, went, I, data. I went into Walgreens. What? To get a, I went into Walgreens to get a flu shot yesterday. I, yep. and I didn't have an appointment. And there was a, a huge line around the store for uh, people lining up for boosters. So, well, that, you know, yes. if, if, if people were calm about this, they wouldn't be the, you know, the week of that you could go get boosters. Um, it was well, I think like that's everyone right. I think that's family. right, Dale. Yeah. So, so you know, it's this sort of sensible Danny Blanchard. I still worry about it. Yes, yes. I mean, I, you know my story that when I got mine, I had my third shot, and I was okay. um, I was in Florida, and it was December the twenty eighth, and they said we've got some good stuff. Do you want to go and line up? So I got there at four thirty in the morning, and I lined up for eight hours. Oh, seriously, and yeah. I got a shot in December. So then I had my third booster because it was you know nine months after the first one, but. But there yeah. were a lot of people there. I mean, there was, you know, there was yeah. a thousand people basically standing in line at four o'clock in the morning. That was yeah. how I mean, you had to be sick. So, so the whole world has PTSD uh, from uh, COVID. Well, but, but Dale, there's another thing. There's another thing too. And we're starting to see evidence of long COVID. And, yeah. and David Kotok particularly has been worried about it. But think about, um, we have, uh, the estimates are between five and 10 million people in the US have long COVID. Either yeah. because you know because they got PTSD or because they were on a ventilator or they had organ yeah. failure or something, and that's yeah. going to impact the labour market. It's going to impact you know whether people show up to work. It's going to impact whether they're able to work, and so this is going to have long and lingering effects. Which doesn't how long that... before we go to universal income here in the US? <laughs> long before that, but I think the answer <laughs> is that you know. But the answer, Dale, is that you know this is a deep shock. An economy is still adjusting. And the last thing we should do is be, is be kicking people while they're down. So the idea of tapering, raising rates anytime soon with this collapsing consumer confidence seems to me a big error. Yeah, it's 1930 all yeah. over. Isn't that what the Fed did uh, after the in the 30s? They right. started tightening again when right. it looked like exactly. we were coming out of it. So, Same well, thing. The thing. Yeah, that's exactly what the... So you, you got monetary policy wrong. Um, allow collapse of banks, which causes the great crash. You're on yeah. the gold standard. You're doing much too tight monetary policy. The, the answer is through all of this, what's the scale of the shock, Dale? This is a negative shock. I mean, the, so just go yesterday. The government yesterday, try this one. The government yesterday in the UK in its forecast, forecast that GDP growth in 2022 with a raging COVID was going to be 6%. What do you think the chances of that are? None. 6%. 6% growth. Six There's a 6% chance that is. 6% GDP growth I'll in 2022. It. Good yeah. luck with that. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I, uh, uh, I'm going to go out and buy some bonds. Here you go. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to go buy some freeze-dried food. And um, <laughs> I, I work from home, so, you know, I, I could stay COVID-free. I'll get you boost for the shop. I will do that, and uh, I, I will set up a time for us to talk about this again, because I think that some of the things you're talking about, we're going to see definitely either into or after the holidays. It's going to be interesting Well, I mean, I mean the, the right thing there is to wait and watch what this stuff is doing. You know, let's yeah. see if, this is, if the labor market participation rates will go in the other direction. But as I said, yeah. yesterday's Gallup sentiments that data was scared me senseless. It was minus 33 in April 20. It was up to one in June. Now it's minus 25. You're going to ignore that? You're going to ignore the fact that people are afraid? No, and I'm going to look for a place to short this market early next year for a 30% decline. I think that's the right thing to do. That's what I'm going to look to do.
Well, just what, I mean, uh, and then the Steve question. can ask you questions, and uh, yeah, it was really as uh, it was really fun. It's always fun having you here, Danny, and uh, um, uh, I think people should uh, you know follow you and listen, and you know it's fine. The paper that I've been doing is, is on my website. You can go to my Twitter feed; I've got it there. But if you need to, you can go to my website, and these papers are all downloadable. You can get them and look at them. And the question is, you know, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but maybe yeah, I'm not. sure, maybe I'm not. And if I'm not, then you're in trouble because I've been right yeah. the last six times in a row. That's it. That's okay. it. Well, there you're do you're you're due for, uh, to be wrong, but I, I, you know, with what I see, I don't think so. So looks like you revamped it a little bit. Yeah. So there's the economics of walking about and predicting risks. Go back up. That's the paper that people should look to. The okay. economics of walking about and predicting U.S. down to there's a little there's a little note for the U.K. about why the Bank of England shouldn't raise rates. That's the recession is the threat. So that just says they're out of their tiny minds if they think they're going to raise rates. And then there's others. There's, if you go down a bit, there's a couple of others too, which is about Europe. So you can, so we have data predicting. I'm sorry if you go down a bit more, keep going. Yeah. So there's another, go back up, see my fishing pictures. <laughs> we know what Danny fish. likes to do. I Danny's like crossing fish. his fingers and hoping. Yeah. That's crossing and fingers and hoping economics. Yeah. I think that's, I think. Uh, that's where that's where you know we are. hope is danny you know hope is the oxygen in our lives and the car well, hope dioxide. is the oxygen but fear but fear is is important right so we so these so if you go up a little bit there's a couple of other papers up there too go up a bit please okay yeah so Brett. yeah so anyway those are the real ones i'm sorry you've gone past that's it okay. again there's a couple of others there about europe i mean the other thing the other thing so um yeah it's down a bit more yeah, there's there's more there. So the the, yeah, the economics of walking about and predicting unemployment is another one. I mean, the, okay. so Dale, there's another set of things there where in Europe we have these data which say which ask people what do you think is going to happen to unemployment? It's called we call it the fear of unemployment, and you yeah. say hope is right, but also people know right. People know that unemployment is going to rise. If you ask people, do you think the unemployment rate is going to rise? Turns out. They're much better than the markets. They're much better than macroeconomists. And we talk about the fact that, that people actually know. So hope's important, but also lack of hope is pretty important, Dale. And if, yeah. I mean, remember, oh, yeah. through, remember through this, Despair. if people think there's going to be a collapse in the, in the stock market, or if yeah. people think there's going to be a recession, there's going to be a recession. It doesn't matter what the macro forecasters say. It doesn't matter what the markets say. It doesn't matter it's all psychology. Matter. Confidence. Well, think- so isn't it confidence and... You lose that when people understand the con in the confidence. Well, that, that's true. They also understand the con in econometrics too, right? Oh Which yeah, is many of us do. But well, I think you know, that, Danny, I could go on with you for forever, but we um, got to stop. Well, let's do it yeah, again but, when we. Uh, well, we'll look at some data coming. I mean, the okay. question is: Does does some data come that suggests that I'm wrong, or so does uh-huh. some data come suggesting I'm right? And we'll see. Yeah. I hope you're wrong. I do too. I know you do. All right, Danny. So uh, if I don't talk to you uh, before, have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Up. You too. And, uh, I've, I've really got another two grandchildren since I last spoke. I've now oh, got you're, nine. Yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> ble- oh, my God. All those yeah, genes yeah. are, they're all over the place, your genes. They're all over the place. And the first one was born, I put a load of money into a stock fund. I said, oh, that'll be fine. I thought I was yeah. going to get one or two. And now I'm, uh, now I'm up to, you know, it's cost me more money. Children are costing uh, me more I think, money than I expected. <laughs> you're a happy man despite what you have to write uh exactly. you, have to, you exactly. have to say you have to say what you see and uh and, yeah. and go fishing yeah all right buddy bye buddy Thank i you. hope you ca- uh, good uh good fishing good hunting and yes, sir. uh let's keep in touch and do it again cool. danny rock and Thank roll you. bye guys adios so everyone that's a wrap uh, i know we ran a little over and uh you could join the team in 10 minutes for the morning edge i want to thank everybody for being with us this week and we hope we added value to what you're trying to accomplish it's a, not an easy thing to do um it's easier to talk about it than do it and i hope that uh, you know what we do here every day um you know teaches you things that he's like danny's a fisherman so we're trying to teach you how to fish So have a great weekend, everyone. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Adios. Enjoy your weekend and see you next week. 
Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.